All right, let's see if we're back on. And I think now everything should be uploaded and we should be live and ready to get started and get going. So guys, welcome back to our live webinar. Once again, I just wanted to remind everyone the whole purpose of doing these live webinars is so that one, I get a chance to really connect with you guys on a much more um, closer level to talk about the latest studies that are happening and to be able to take your questions. Holly, thank you so much for joining. I apologize. I was a couple of minutes late. I was just fiddling around with the software and I had some difficulty. Uh, I believe it's Donato. Hi, Donato. Thank you so much for joining tonight. I know it's Friday night. I know you have so many better things you could be doing with your time. So thank you, both of you. I'm blessed that you guys would both join me and for everybody else who's joining as well. Thank you guys for joining us today. While folks are joining, um, let me sh share with you guys some of the exciting research and everything. What I try to do is pick out the latest research that's happening. So by doing this every other week, hi, Marilyn, by doing this every other week, I'm going to have a chance to share with you the latest studies as they come up. And you'll be able to hear all sorts of studies, not just about kidneys, but we'll talk about kidney disease. We'll talk about weight loss. We'll talk about longevity studies. We'll talk about nutrition studies. So this way, you guys are going to be able to hear all sorts of studies in a variety of different ways. And the concept here is so that you can learn how to take the best care of yourself, whether you have kidney disease, heart disease, any disease, or no disease. The goal here is the concept of self, sleep, exercise, love, food, is so that you can learn to live your life in the best way possible. And then I was just saying before I got started that because we're at that point of right behind Thanksgiving, it's a great opportunity to give thanks. So let me first of all say thanks to all of you guys. This channel wouldn't even be around if it wasn't for you guys. You inspire me to be a better version of myself. You know, anytime I'm feeling lazy, I don't want to work out. I think about the courage each one of you guys has. Some of your stories are so incredible, so inspiring. The hardships you've gone through, the courage it takes for you to share with essentially strangers on YouTube, on Facebook. It's incredible. So thank you for sharing your journey, for sharing your triumphs and your failures. It's amazing. My journey, as difficult as I think it is, it's peanuts compared to what you guys have gone through. And speaking of peanuts, they're awesome, by the way. So while you guys are thinking about your questions to ask, let me share a couple of interesting studies that are happening. There's a new drug. The name of it is Zepbound. And Zepbound is just a new name for a drug that already got approval under the name of Manjaro. These drugs, under the generic name of Terzepatide, the brand name is Manjaro or Zepbound. Manjaro has the indication for diabetes management. Zepbound has the indication for obesity management. This is the first class that we call a dual GLP GIP agonist. The reason these drugs are such a big deal is because if you look at social media, these GLP agonists have made waves all over the place. They're associated with a substantial amount of weight loss. The typical one like Ozempic Vigovi has around 15% or so weight loss. When you get to Manjaro slash Zepbound, you're looking at about 22 and a half to 25%. So a lot of weight loss. But what I want to talk about is, is something that most of the folks on social media or even doctors don't talk about, which is realizing the side effects. And so there's a few main side effects. Let me cover them, as well as the new study out about the heart rate idea that I want you to be aware of. So in terms of weight loss, what you want to know is these drugs are very effective but there are some side effects you just need to know. First, there is a risk of stomach paralysis. We still don't have enough data to say what the incidence is like. So it's very, very important that you are aware that stomach paralysis in those patients who had it, when they stopped taking the drug, it didn't get better, number one. Number two is, is the other risk was there's a risk of depression and suicide with these weight loss drugs, and you want to be aware of that. So if you're somebody who su suffers from depression or suicide, taking Ozempic, Vigovi, Manjaro, Zepbound, uh, Saxenda, all of these drugs are linked to the risk of higher incidence of depression and even suicide. Marilyn, yes, this is referring to Manjaro as one of them. Now, 
The other risks are things like thyroid cancer, which is very little, we don't know enough about, and the last risk of pancreatitis, which is very low. But the thing that I want to talk about today is there's a new studies out. This is an obesity metabolism 2023, and this is a meta, um, um, meta-analysis of about six studies, and basically it shows that there can be an increase in heart rate when you take specifically terzepatide, which goes under the brand name of Zepbound or Manjaro. How much of a heart rate increase are we talking about? It's not much. 95% of the confidence interval, in other words, the majority of the patients, so 95% of the patients in those areas had a heart rate increase of about 1.3 to about four and a half beats. So basically your heart rate went up by about four and a half beats maximum on that. That's for 95% of the patients. But in a few patients, meaning about 2.5% of the patients, the heart rate increased more than about 4.5 beats per minute. Now, this doesn't sound like much, but the question is, why make a big deal about this? Well, the reason this is important is because if you have underlying heart disease and your heart rate is going up by 5 beats per minute, then that in itself can increase the risk of things like cardiovascular mortality by about 16%. That's a small increase, but it is an increase. So why should that matter? Because whenever you're starting medications and you already have underlying disease, you want to be aware of side effects. And so you want to talk to your doctor about the pros and the cons anytime you get started. It's very, very important. That's the only thing you want to know. It's not to say that the drugs are terrible, but remember, the first part of this is lifestyle. The second part is lifestyle. And the third part is lifestyle. When you have that down, you can use the medicines, whether that be uh, Zepbound, which is the new name for Manjaro for weight loss, or whether that's Vigovi or Ozempic as a tool to help you. Now, the other thing is, is if you have kidney disease, these same medications are showing that they're beneficial in slowing down the rate of decline in kidney disease and slowing down the amount of protein that you're spilling in kidney disease. Hi, Philip. So Philip asked the question, hello, doctor, should someone with mild proteinuria be on a max dose of an ACE or ARB to reduce protein leak as much as possible? So, Philip, the answer is, is the most important thing is, is you want to minimize the protein in the urine as much as possible. And so that is the definition. You're trying to get rid of that protein because by definition, as that protein spills through, it's going to damage the glomerulus, the top portion of the kidney, and then the tubules as it filters through. And you want to reduce that impact. So that means your nephrologist is going to titrate the medication up. If they see that the blood pressure is elevated, they will titrate the medication up to lower your blood pressure. And if they still see that the protein is there, even though the blood pressure is okay, he or she will still go up on the ACE or ARB to try to lower the protein in the urine as long as your blood pressure can tolerate it. So the answer is not so much that we're just trying to hit a maximum dose of an ACE or ARB. What we're trying to do is minimize the leakage of protein in the urine as much as possible. In exact terms, the protein to creatinine ratio, we're trying to get it less than 500. That's the goal as far as that goes. So if we can, we want to get it less than 500. So we're always trying to aim for that. Normal is less than 200. Obviously, if we can get it less than 200, that's even better. All right. There's an interesting study. And this is a study that was just published in Diabetes 2023. Traditionally, when we talk about diabetic nephropathy, which is where diabetes ends up attacking your kidneys, the way to diagnose diabetic nephropathy is we have to do a kidney biopsy. And as you know, kidneys are one of the most vascular organs. What that really means is basically you get about 20% of your blood from your heart going to your kidneys. So sticking a needle into your kidneys is 
most of the time it's very safe because we do it under CT scan or ultrasound. Most of the people doing the biopsies are experienced, but bleeding is a risk. And we have to caution patients that bleeding can be significant. Now, knock on wood, in my experience, that has not been the case, but I still have to warn all my patients that it could be. You never say never whenever you're doing a procedure because the one time you get comfortable, God forbid, that could be the time that there's an adverse outcome. So we always tell our patients, but there's a study, this is the diamond study, and what they were really looking at was, is there a way that as we continue to get better blood tests and as we're starting to use more high-powered computers and the power of AI, is it possible that we can come up with a way to be able to use different markers to essentially predict if somebody does have diabetic nephropathy? So this study, Kim et al., Diabetes 2023, they had 126 people that had type 2 diabetes. They all underwent kidney biopsy and they were all shown to have diabetic nephropathy. Now, this is looking retrospectively. And so what they wanted to see was, could they identify what the factors that were all similar in these patients were that they could tell that, you know, we could identify patients in the future as having diabetic nephropathy without necessarily having to poke them with a kidney. So what they found was that, one, of course, if you have type 2 diabetes, that's the greatest risk factor for developing diabetic nephropathy. Number two was how long you've had type 2 diabetes, generally speaking, more than five years. Next was, what's your A1C? What's your hemoglobin A1C level? Obviously, the higher it is, the more likely the risk. The presence of eye disease, what we call diabetic retinopathy. So if you had eye disease, you were more likely to have diabetic nephropathy. So once again, if you have lots of protein that you're spilling, so one of the hallmarks of diabetic kidney diseases, you start to spill a lot of protein. How do you know? You'll start to see swelling. You'll start to see that your urine is very foamy. So you start to see those things. And one of the things they found in this study was that if your doctor says, look, you're starting to get diabetic eye disease, what we call diabetic retinopathy, your sugars are high, and you've been a diabetic more than five years, then that increases the risk that you probably have diabetic kidney disease. The older you are, the more likely that was the case. In addition to those markers, they found that now they can do certain urine tests and they look for certain things like alanine, choline, all sorts of some um, fancier terms like trigonaline. These are all predictive when it comes to the idea of whether or not you have diabetic nephropathy. And the last one was N-phenylacetylglycine. So the concept here is, is, as we continue to progress in technology, there may come a day where we may no longer need to do actual kidney biopsies, where we may have enough markers to be able to avoid you that risk. Hopefully, you never even need to go there because you're able to take care of yourself and not have to worry about kidney disease. But God forbid, if you're dealing with that, and this is something you're going through, then it's nice to know that technology is progressing. And then just for the new folks who are sort of signing on right now, welcome, guys. Thank you so much for spending your Friday evening with me. So I think it's Hiking Utah. Welcome there. And uh, Byzantine Ladybug, welcome again. No worries for being late. Glad to see everyone is joining. So always wonderful to see the returns. And as you guys know, we've changed it around a little bit. Now we're going to do this twice a month. This way it gives me a little bit more time to be able to come to you guys and share with you the latest and greatest studies because I being able to share studies as well agree that a plant-based diet is better for chronic kidney disease. Does that mean my kidneys would be less healthy if I eat animal protein, say, once a week? So 
the answer to that question is not necessarily. So once again, what the data shows, and this is an important concept to understand, is what the data shows is that if you look at everything in life as a spectrum, and you start to move towards the idea of more plants, as you do, the more plants, All right, it looks like the connection dropped there for a second. So I wanna make sure that you guys are still able to hear me okay and that I'm back in terms of the connection okay. So let's make sure that the connection is back on for you guys. And I'm gonna double check it on my end too, just to make sure everything is working so bear with me for just one quick second so i can double check everything and if you guys are on the line and you guys can hear me okay just tell me if you guys can um see me oh yes you can thank you philip i appreciate that all right so let's continue in terms of going back to the question of animal versus plant-based okay so when you talk about animal versus plant-based just remember after about 80%, 80% is where you get the most benefit. After about 80%, not a whole lot more that you're going to get. So if you're already at 80%, that's awesome. If you're at 100%, more power to you. But don't feel like you have to be at 100% to get the best benefits. In other words, if you're somebody who wants to go and let's say have meat once a week, it's your prerogative. If that's what you believe in, fine. But if you're somebody who uh, believes in the environment, feels that you know they don't want to eat any animal products, if that's the case, don't. From just a medical perspective, if you're just talking about a medical perspective, what we recommend is a plant-predominant diet, a plant predominant diet. That's what we focus on. And so keep that in mind as you're thinking about it is, is there's a lot of folks that are in social media that are all sorts of gurus. Remember, I'm not a guru. I'm just a guy trying to read as much research as he can and trying to do the right thing by you. That's my only goal. And so what that means is, is I'm not in any camp. You know, I follow a plant-based diet. I believe in a whole food plant-based diet. I think it's good for the environment, but those are personal beliefs. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Have I done meat? Yes, of course I have. I grew up in a very poor area. I used to eat fast food all the time. And so nobody is perfect. And we have to understand the concept that nobody's perfect. And part of being human is being able to forgive and being able to love. And that's always been my motto, is forgive, love, move on. And that's very, very important. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. At what level of proteinuria would you recommend a biopsy? So generally for biopsy, there's a couple of things. First is, if it's just protein in the urine and you're treating it and you can control it, then it doesn't make any sense to do a biopsy. What I always tell my young doctors when they start and I'm training them, I say, if you did a biopsy, would you do anything different with the results? That's the most important question I ask them is, if you got the results, would you do anything different? So in other words, if you ended up getting the results and all you would say is, well, Mrs. Jones, your biopsy shows diabetic nephropathy and I need you to eat more plants. I need you to cut out the donuts. I need you to exercise every day. Well, those are the same things that I would be talking to Mrs. Jones about anyway. Sleep more, move more, practice gratitude and kindness, right? Eat more plants, get rid of the junk food, all of that stuff. So if that's the case, then the answer is, is the biopsy is not needed because I'm putting a person at risk. So it's not so much specifically level of proteinuria as it is, can I do something different? For example, if I'm worried that the kidney function is deteriorating rapidly, and if I find out 
what the underlying diagnosis is. And I can use uh, immunosuppressives, I can use steroids, or I can use some kind of strong medication to stop the underlying condition, then a biopsy absolutely makes sense. And Byzantine, thank you for your support about twice a month. Uh, Linda asked the question, my EGFR, or estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is a, a way of us sort of saying how well your kidneys are functioning is around 35. What stage is that? So remember, there's about five stages, and now we have subdivisions just to make it a little bit more specific there. So the way it works is stage five, which is essentially dialysis territory, is a kidney function of 15 and below. Stage four is about 15 to 30. That's stage four. Stage three is a GFR of 30 to 60. Now, stage three, nowadays, we break it up into what we call stage 3A and stage 3B. That basically means starting from 60, coming down to 45, that's considered stage 3A. From 45 coming down to 30 would be stage 3B. That's it. So there you have stage 3 from 60 to 30, stage 4 from 30 to 15, stage 5, 15 and below. Now, stage 2 is between 60 to 90, but you only say stage 2 if you have evidence of kidney damage. If you don't, then you don't say it. So in other words, everybody who's walking around with kidney functions in 70, 80, no protein in the urine, nothing else going on, they don't have kidney disease by definition. That's just a normal kidney function, even though they fall in a GFR that would be in stage two. So don't let a GFR scare you if you're above 60. And then stage one is a GFR greater than 90, but once again, in the presence of kidney damage. All right, let's go. So then it says, um, Chad, hi, Chad. Chad asked the question, what diet recommendations would you provide for nephrotic syndrome, say for renal amyloidosis? So as you know, renal amyloidosis specifically is a very difficult disease to treat. That's number one. Number two is when it comes to the nephrotic syndrome part of it, it's the same concept. So when you have nephrotic syndrome, as you know, you're losing a substantial amount of protein, you're also losing all of your immune system with it, and that makes it challenging. Even there, what we still recommend is trying to reduce the acid burden on the kidney because reducing the acid burden is still overall better. You know, some of the things that we've talked about, for example, is the fact that in diabetics, you can still do a keto diet. We talked about on the last live webinar, the idea that if you looked at polycystic kidney disease, the diet that's recommended is a keto diet. But if you're going to do a keto, we still recommend the plant-based version because you reduce the renal acid load or what we call PRAL, P-R-A-L, potential renal acid load. Acid overall drives the machinery very fast and causes the cells to die faster. That's it. There is nothing against any of the diets per se, but in terms of your specific question, all we're trying to do is just to lower the amount of pressure on the kidneys. And then the second part is, is a lot of people think, well, what happens if I am spilling a lot of protein? Don't I need to put protein back? The problem is, is as you load more protein, you're going to spill more protein, but you can have your protein level starting to go down so low that you're in this malnourished category where you need protein. And in those places, when you have to supplement, what we recommend is using sources of plant-based proteins. That's where things like tofu, once again, are excellent to consider. All right, let's take a look. Uh, next question is, is uh, Marilyn asked a question years ago, the doctor told me they couldn't do a kidney biopsy and they saw a mass on my kidney. So they removed one kidney, no cancer. So now I have one kidney. 
how long have biopsies been done? Okay, so this is a really important question is because when you have a mass on the kidney, one of the concerns that doctors have had and radiologists have had is, let's say that you have a cancer inside the kidney and that cancer is in one specific spot and it's staying there. So say my fist is this cancer and this big old space around it is the kidney. Now I take my needle and I go in and I go and take a piece of this tissue and then I take my needle back out. Now that I've opened up this, this cell or this mass that was cancerous, I've created this nice tract and that tract actually goes out of the kidney capsule. So it allows potentially for the cells, the cancer cells, to not only get to other parts of the kidney, but potentially to leave the kidney. So the danger that people have always been worried about is that could you actually seed and potentially spread the cancer to other parts if you're going to go ahead and biopsy a cancer like that, especially in one of the most vascular organs of the body. This is why a lot of times when they see solid masses, folks don't like to biopsy them. In the olden days, and you know, it's not like uh, it's that long ago, but technology has gotten a lot better. Oftentimes, they ended up doing nephrectomies, which is taking out the whole kidneys when there was a suspicious looking mass. I've had many patients where they took the, the mass out. Unfortunately, it was not a cancer, so the kidney did get taken out. But the problem is, if they had left it and it was cancer, and God forbid the cancer spread, that could have been devastating. Now, they have other techniques. For example, they can freeze the mass. That's an option. They can take out a portion of the kidney. There's much better treatments that are available. So technology has come a long ways. Number two is, is Marilyn, just for you to know, we have so many people that are born with one kidney. I have taken care of so many people that are born with one kidney. There are so many people out there that donate one of their kidneys just because that's what they want to do for the goodness from their heart. And what I can tell you about them is they go on to have very good, normal, long lives. So the answer to your question is, is even if you have one kidney, it doesn't mean it's going to lower your life. It doesn't mean that the quality of your life will be affected. So overall, you can still continue to be happy and healthy. Do you need to be more careful? Absolutely. In other words, you do need to watch your blood pressure. You need to watch your weight. You need to watch your blood sugars. Absolutely. Those are things that you can control and you can avoid. So those would be very important. But beyond that, mm -mm. you just want to make sure those things are very important. All right. Um, Byzantine, could someone let me know the next live stream? Oh, I'm so sorry you didn't get a notification. So moving forward, all the live streams will be on the first and third Friday of each month. Every single month, unless it's a holiday, if it's a holiday, I'll put it on there so that you know we can all enjoy it with our families. But on the first and third Friday, 5 p.m. of each month, come rain or shine, every single month moving forward, first and third Friday. And this way, five o'clock, six o'clock, Pacific Central Time. So PST, for those of you guys in the East Coast, that would be 8 p.m. And then you'll see it that there's a newsletter on selfprincipal.org. You can sign up on the uh, uh, email list. That's the nonprofit website. You can sign up right there. And then I try to send out the newsletter so that folks have reminders as well. Okay, next question. Before we go to the next question, let me share another study with you guys. I think this is a really important one. And this is about vitamin B12. So this is a study published in Nature Metabolism 2023. So vitamin B12 is one of the most underrated vitamins out there. It's such an important vitamin. Everybody, I believe, should be taking it, especially if you're over the age of 50, but it's water soluble. You can't really get toxic off it. You're going to end up peeing it out. But vitamin B12 is something you should all be using anyways. If you're a kidney patient, we talk about a B complex. There's all sorts of kidney vitamin brands out there that you might have heard about. Um, renal vite, nephrovite, all sorts of vites out there, but they're essentially 
B complexes with a teeny, 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 tiny bit of vitamin C in there. That's essentially what they are. So vitamin B12, if you've seen some of the videos in the past that I've done, it basically is really important for brain health, for memory. It's important for your nerves to be able to function well. We've talked about the fact that when we talk about anemia, we think about vitamin B12, we think about folate, right? Those are really important. So supporting blood cell production, B12 is very important. And helping DNA synthesis, that DNA, which is the building blocks of our entire bodies, it does. But now there's a brand new study, and this is a fascinating study because what it shows is that vitamin B12 is also incredibly important when it comes to telling cells how to program. So it's responsible in actually programming cells and in helping tissues to do regeneration. So one more time, the newest thing to add to the multitude of things that B12 can do is that B12 can help with cellular programming, that's the fancy, you know, $10,000 word, and tissue regeneration. This is a fascinating thing. So what they showed in this particular study was that researchers used a model of ulcerative colitis. And what they found was that giving B12, vitamin B12 supplementation actually helped the intestinal cells to start to repair themselves. And this is really, really cool because if you think about ulcerative colitis, there's all this inflammation. It's a self-destructive process. And the treatment is steroids and all sorts of really strong medicines that are designed to lower the immune system. But what if a simple thing, and I'm not saying that vitamin B12 by itself will fix everything, but it could be a tool. So what if something as simple as vitamin B12 can help our cells to start to function better? And remember, vitamin B12 absorption is terrible, right? So what's what's really interesting about the dosage of vitamin B12 is the dosage is about 2.4 micrograms, micrograms per day for all folks over the age of 14. So 2.4 is the quote unquote recommended dosage. But here's the thing. When we look at our bodies, our bodies only absorb about 10 micrograms of essentially 500 micrograms that we take orally. So if you take a supplement of about 500 micrograms, you're only absorbing around 10 micrograms out of it. So that's why when you take a B12 supplement or you take a B complex and it has these dosages like 500 or 1,000, don't be fooled by the idea I'm taking 1,000 and you know it should be doing all that. Yes, you're taking a thousand, but you know, if you're a diabetic, if you're obese and so forth, you may not be absorbing as much as you think. It's really not as much because of the fact that we generally don't. So some people get around it by giving injections. Some people think that lozenges are better than just oral. So oral, it may not be as good as sublingual. Sublingual may be better. And of course, taking it through injections may be, of course, the best way possible. And as we get older, the absorption of B12 actually goes down. All right, let's take a look at next question. So uh, Holly asked the question, which and what tests show kidney damage and kidney disease? So a few things. If you are thinking about what tests to think about for kidney damage, the first thing is, is you can look at a couple of things, an ultrasound or a picture of the kidneys, a CT scan will do the same thing, but you know, an ultrasound doesn't give you the radiation, so why get the radiation if you don't need it? So an ultrasound or a CT scan will tell you the size of the kidneys. So what that can show you is, is if you're starting to get scarring. You know, when you become a diabetic, for example, the kidneys first get larger because they're actually compensating for all the pressure. And as the cells start to die, then the large kidneys start to shrink, 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 shrink. So some people who have normal-sized kidneys but have been a diabetic for a while, it's because first 
the kidneys got larger and now they're shrinking. So we can actually look at how the kidneys look and we look at the echogenicity on an ultrasound and see that because of all of the sort of the shadows and how it's lighting, we can see that the kidney is starting to get scarred. Of course, we can tell by blood test and looking at things like what does the creatinine show? Remember, creatinine has nothing to do with the kidneys. Creatinine comes from things like muscles and so forth. And so what happens is creatinine is getting filtered through the kidneys. If the kidneys are working well, then the creatinine is getting filtered through the kidneys so the blood level will be low. But if the kidneys are not working well, then you can't get rid of the creatinine so well. And so creatinine builds up in the blood. So when we see an elevated creatinine in the blood, we then say that must mean that your kidneys are not working well. So creatinine is an indirect way of measuring kidney function. We have direct ways, but they're more invasive. But because the creatinine works as well as it does, you can use that. Now, there's other markers other than creatinine that we've talked about in the past that you can think about. But essentially, that's the, the main number that you'll hear about. And GFR, or glomerular filtration rate, is useful because we use equations that put creatinine, put your age in there, and a couple other variables to calculate a percentage, so to speak, of how well your kidney function is working. All right, next question. Um, Philip asked the question, what are your thoughts on magnesium glycinate? Well, Philip, I can tell you, I take magnesium, specifically the glycinate variety, every evening. So as you know, some of the things I've talked about on this show is the idea that, one, there's about 10 different types of magnesiums out there, um, magnesium oxide, magnesium citrate, glycinate, threonate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And glycinate, what's really interesting about the glycinate variety is glycinate makes you relax. And glycinate... So you don't have to worry about having the diary and so forth, but it's journey with others I have not shared my journey with, but you know. And I look, it looks like it disconnected me again, but I'm back. So let's make sure that you guys can, uh, can still hear me and everything is back on again. But I just wanted to, uh, to say, you know, I have two beautiful daughters and, and everything I do is always about making sure that when they get a chance to grow older and look back on their father's life, that they're proud of the fact that what I did was meaningful to people. So that's about it. But coming back to the idea about magnesium glycinate, I think it's wonderful. It helps me out in terms of my own journey. It helps me to sleep better at night. I'm a big believer of having a fixed sleep schedule. I try to focus on seven to nine hours of sleep every night. I actually try to get eight because I know that sometimes I get up and so forth. So it's actually about seven quality hours that I'm getting. That's why I aim for eight every time. Um, let's see. and. Um, Chad Charrington, it's MD. So I, if you're a physician, then I'll say Dr. Charrington. Uh, it says Med Onc, whole food, uh, plant-based diet, 
exercise oncologist here. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm grateful that you're here with us. Is there quality, quantitative, or qualitative evidence that animal uh, proteins may injury the kidney in excess? So the idea is it's not that it's animal proteins, it's the acid load. And for that portion, the acid load, there's plenty of data around. So we have lots of data in terms of that. In fact, you can find lots of studies and there's lots of um, references on the channel. If you look at, you'll find them. So what happens as the kidneys get worse is we actually use sodium bicarbonate as a way of trying to delay the progression of kidney disease. There's a lot of data that shows that sodium bicarbonate, remember it is sodium, but it's sodium bicarbonate can actually delay the progression of kidney disease. And so what happens there is, is we use a plant-based diet instead of the sodium bicarbonate because most of our patients already have high blood pressure. And I'm going to talk about the whole high blood pressure thing in a second. So the idea here is it's all about the acid load and we're trying to minimize the acid load. And this is why when we talk about fish, we say fish from an acid perspective is neutral. And that's why people who are pesco vegetarian, they do just fine. And there's no data that's arguing against folks that are pesco vegetarian. Holly asked the question, should kidney patients take vitamin K? So Holly, remember when we talk about vitamin K, there's K1, there's K2. And what we've talked about is, is, and of course, this is not talking about patients who have AFib or need Coumadin, et cetera. But what we've talked about, the idea is that when you're taking vitamin D3 and you combine that with K2, specifically the M. K7 version, the MK7 version. What ends up there when you take the MK7 version is, is that by taking the vitamin D3 with K2, it will take the calcium that the vitamin D causes absorption in your gut and it will deliver it to your bones. It will deliver it to the places where you need it instead of getting deposited in your blood vessels. One of the things that I always discourage my colleagues from doing is, is giving mega doses of vitamin D replacement. And the reason I say that is because those mega doses cause mega doses of calcium absorption. And if your body can't use this high amount of calcium at once, what's going to happen is, is that calcium will go and precipitate with phosphorus and you will get calcium phosphate precipitation in your blood vessels. And that's why our kidney patients, when you look at their x-rays, it literally lights up like a Christmas tree. And that's the reason why. So in terms of kidney patients, and we're talking kidney patients who don't have atrial fibrillation or an anticoagulation, those, if they're going to take D3, they can take it with K2. Of course, you always want to run it by your nephrologist to make sure that there's no medication that's going to interfere, but vitamin K2. And K2 comes in different isoforms. It's the MK7 because the MK7 is the one that's absorbed the best. Um, have you seen or is there any data about kidney recovery on a whole food plant-based diet? So this is where it's really important. And this is from Dr. Uh, Charrington. I hope I'm saying that name correctly. But the, the question about kidney recovery is very tricky because, you know, some of the folks that present this data, unfortunately, what they don't realize is, is they're looking at the data only measuring creatinine or GFR. So let's say you weigh 300 pounds, you're making more creatinine because you have more muscle. If you lose weight, if you lose weight, you're going to lose muscle with it. By definition, you're going to make less creatinine. And as an oncologist in your practice, you would know that your patients, when they go through chemotherapy, what you find is their GFRs oftentimes go up. And the reason they go up is because they get so malnourished that it's not uncommon to see the fact that their GFRs go up, their creatinines go down to like 0 0.3, 0 0.4. They're very, very low and their GFRs are up. That's only because they've lost all their muscles. They become very, very malnourished. So their creatinine production is very low. So when people talk about recovery, true recovery is based on the idea that their proteinuria 
or protein spillage go away? Is their blood pressure better? We need actual markers of kidney damage, and that's the tricky part. And that's where I have a hard time trying to be able to say how much recovery there is. I know some people on the internet, some people on YouTube say, look, I went from a CKD5 to a CKD3, but that is not saying much. True recovery is, is I took somebody who was spilling 10 grams of proteinuria, I put him on a plant-based diet, I caused them to lose weight, I brought their blood pressure better, I restricted their sodium, and now as a result of all those changes, what I'm seeing is, is that their proteinuria from 10,000 milligrams is down to 500 milligrams. That means that's true, real recovery. And so your next question I see here is, is, is too low creatinine insufficient muscle mass? Yes. In fact, you know, one of the things that people forget, especially folks that are really into the whole foods plant-based diet is, is that you must, you must, if you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're a child, you must work out. Walking is not enough. You have to add resistance training. And I don't mean you got to go join gym and be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger, whatever your definition of resistance training is, but you got to add resistance training. It's absolutely critical to be able to do that. All right, let me um, share with you another study because I think this is really important. There's two really important studies I want to make sure I get to for you guys tonight. First one is the Esprit trial. This is from China. And this is basically arguing about blood pressure and what's the optimal number. As you know, on this um, show, I've talked about a few times that bringing the blood pressure down is very important. There's more data coming out that the ideal blood pressure is less than 120 as the top number. So in this study, they were looking at the more intensive target of less than 120 versus less than 140. And basically, their composite endpoint, what their endpoint was, was the risk of heart attack, heart failure, stroke, or cardiovascular death. And what they found was that this risk, this composite endpoint decreased by 12%, and the number needed to treat was only 74 patients. In addition, cardiovascular deaths decreased by 39%, all-cause mortality decreased by 21%. And other studies like the SPRINT trial, the ACCORD trial, RESPECT trial also showed that a blood pressure target of less than 120 is better than 140. Now, what does this mean for all of us? Using less salt and more whole foods is ideal because it will help you to be able to get your blood pressure lower. And then we use medications, but exercise and food are your first and foremost things. And when I talk about a whole food, don't get fooled by, you know, all the fast food restaurants having plant-based meals because they're loaded with salt. And when it comes to salt, salt is absolutely a big deal. There's another study, and this was published in JAMA uh, just this year, 2023. This is Gupta et al. And what they did was they showed that even if you're on blood pressure medications, if you go on a low sodium diet, you can lower your blood pressure by about eight points simply by adding on a low sodium diet on top of blood pressure medications. And what was interesting was in this study, when they measured what the people were normally eating, on average, people were getting about 4.6 grams of sodium. 4.6 grams of sodium. That's a whole lot of salt in their diet that's going in. And they defined a low sodium diet as 1.7 grams. And if you guys know about the Dietary Guidelines of America, you know, those recommendations are to be less than 2.3 grams in men and women ages 14 and older. So what's the message about salt? Salt, everybody, Everybody in America eats way too much salt. And if you have high blood pressure, it is not the salt shaker. But please use whole foods. Cut the salt out. The more foods in packages, the more you eat out, the more you're getting closer to that four or five thousand milligrams of sodium every day. And if you could just lower that, Lowering your blood pressure about eight points is what 
one blood pressure medication does. On average, a single blood pressure medication will lower your blood pressure about 8 to 10 points. So think about that. Just by cutting out your salt is equivalent to one blood pressure medication. How fascinating is that? Just by doing that, it's amazing. So it's really, really cool that you can go ahead and do that. Uh, all right. And sorry about the video breaking up. And then uh, hopefully everything is okay now. And so, uh, Dr. Charrington, yes to the creatinine part. And then Philip asked the question, what brand would you recommend? I found one, but it has phosphate. So, uh, Philip, I think you're talking about the magnesium one. You know, I try not to recommend brands too much. So I would say is just, you know, look for a quality brand that you can trust, that you like, and you can go with. And I would just leave it at that because I try not to do so. You know, I have as much as I can try to not be any uh, conflicts of interest. Full disclosure, you know, my wife uh, runs a small vitamin company herself. I try not to talk about it so that she can do her own thing separately. And that's why I never bring it up in any of the work that I do so that there's no conflicts there. Um, all right, sorry about the video breaking up. In terms of magnesium glycinate, once again, guys, magnesium glycinate is awesome. You should definitely look into it if you have trouble resting at night, sleeping at night. I use it for migraines. It works wonderful for me as far as migraines go. So it's something that I found very, very helpful. If you have constipation, glycinate is not the one. That's things like magnesium citrate. Those are the things that would help with things like constipation. Um, Holly says, I've been a diabetic for over 25 years. I need, I have those tests when my husband became stage four, he has kidney disease. Yeah, you know, Holly, this is the thing is, is I think sometimes when, when we're going through diabetes, we need a, a team around us. And sometimes we need folks to help us realize how important, how serious it is so we can have people push us to go in the right direction. It becomes so important. Van says, I'm doing water aerobics three times a week. So Van, this is awesome because water creates resistance. So the answer is yes, that is indeed a resistance workout. So one, kudos to you. And two, keep it up, keep it up. And then Philip asked, can you tell us what magnesium is best? Your video cut out. Yeah, so sorry about that. You know, magnesium glycinate is the one that I take in the evening. And magnesium threonate is the one that crosses the blood-brain barrier easily. And I use that because of the fact that it helps me in terms of my memory, especially given the fact that my migraine slash seizures give me such a headache and make it harder for me to sometimes concentrate. So I use both magnesium glycinate and magnesium threonate. Um, Janet asked the question, hello, doctor. I'm worried about dehydration. I have CKD stage four and hypokalemia. My mag, uh, my, I'm sorry, my GFR is 27. I also have tachycardia and proteinuria along with low serum potassium. How much water should I drink? You know, Janet, this is a really difficult question to answer in terms of how much water you should drink because I would have to be able to do some tests, including a 24-hour urine to see how much potassium you're spilling to decide on what's the most appropriate way to refill all of that stuff. If you're having tachycardia, which means rapid heart rate, the first thing is why? Is it because you're you're dehydrated or is it because it's an electrical conduction issue in your heart? Is there something else that's driving that? It would be important. So I would want to know those things so I can figure that portion out. Number two is if your potassium is low, is it because there's a condition like hyperaldosteronism where it holds on to salt? gets rid of potassium through the kidneys. Is that the case? Is there anything else going on? Are you on any medicines that cause you to lose potassium? And if any one of those things are going on, we need to fix that. In general, not in your situation, but in general, what I tell people is, is when it comes to water, one of the best things to do is when you wake up in the morning, start your day by drinking water. What I do, and I'm not saying this is the right thing for everybody because I don't know your situation, but what I do myself is when I wake up, I always try to drink two glasses of water as soon as I wake up in the morning. Go pee, come back, drink two glasses of water. And I do that because I know that before life hits me and I start to get very busy, 
I know that I'm breaking my fast, so to speak, because I'm dehydrated overnight. And it makes a big difference. And for those of you guys who know sort of my, my regimen is, is I always tell people that it becomes very important to try to not eat within four hours before going to bed. Unless you're somebody who's insulin dependent diabetic or you have other issues going on, that's different. But if you're just somebody who doesn't have to worry about your sugars dropping or anything like that, when you don't eat within that four hour window before going to bed, you'll get a deeper restful sleep. And you can definitely drink water, but if you're somebody who gets up in the middle of the night to pee a lot, then what you're doing is you're essentially fasting overnight. And so you wake up in the morning, the first thing you wanna do is rehydrate, and that matters. Roman brought up a very good point. He said, I've cut my salt intake to less than 500 milligrams per day that knocked my blood pressure down another 10 points systolic and about eight points diastolic. Taste buds have adjusted. So it's interesting that you should bring that point is that it actually takes seven to ten days message for today. All right, so sorry, cut me off again. But just the take home message for this last part of the study was that for blood pressure, lower is better. In this study, less than 130, less than 130 actually helped in terms of dementia risk. And the other studies we shared, less than 120 helped as far as overall health goes. So ideal blood pressure, top number should be less than 120. And then let's take one final question in terms of NAC for CT scans with contrast. No, it doesn't really do much. It's hydration. If you wanna protect your kidneys before getting a CAT scan with contrast, Please make sure you hydrate before and you hydrate after. Your radiologist and kidney doctor will go ahead and give you a very simple protocol, but it's all about washing it out. And guys, I do want to apologize today for my internet connection. As you can see, we're actually moving uh, from our ha one house to another. So we're actually in a hotel uh, right now. And this is why this was the uh, internet connection I could do. I promise next month the internet connection will be better. So my apologies as far as that goes. Thank you for putting up with me on this difficult internet connection. Lastly, thank you for supporting this channel. Thank you for supporting me. I, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I know next week is Thanksgiving. You guys have given me so much so much and i'm in a debt of gratitude for you you have the biggest hearts i've ever seen thank you for being who you are please if there's one message i can give you is just be kind nobody will care how smart you are nobody will the only thing people will care is if you got any bit of kindness so with that thank you as always i'm grateful and i'm honored that you would actually spend your friday night with me with this i'm actually going to go my kids are in their wrestling practice right now, so I'm going to go join their wrestling practice. Thank you, guys. I will see you on the first Friday of December at 5 p.m. See you then, everybody.